We're going to start um, our next session right now. Um, we are lucky today to have Lindsay. How do you pronounce your last name? Rax. Rax. Okay, Lindsay Rax, postdoctoral associate at Kaplan Lab at the University of Calgary. Um, and today, Lindsay's going to be talking us through a presentation on making pictures worth a thousand words, effective communication at the intersection of art and science. Take it away, Lindsay. All right. Thank you for having me today. So um, a little bit about me, um, I am uh, I have a PhD in linguistics and I've been working as a data scientist in medicine uh, for now about a year and a half in a postdoc or almost two years actually in a postdoc position. Um, and when I started, um, I wasn't a data scientist. Um, I didn't focus on data visualization and it just turns out that as a linguist and you're studying meaning and things like that, um, you're kind of sort of um, in tune with how to how people digest information, that sort of thing. So I'm going to talk about how we do that with um, images, essentially uh, graphical representation of data, um, and why that's important, especially when we're doing grant writing. Okay, so what is data visualization? So formally, it's defined usually as the graphical representation of data information. Um, so what graphical means depends on who you talk to. Um, it could actually mean things like actual plots, tables, that sort of things. And a lot of times we use their images to convey information. Um, and so it, it really is a whole host of things. Um, I like to think of it really as being sort of at the intersection of art and science. So you want to make things visually appealing, but you also want to convey accurate and precise information. Um, and you want to do it in a way that's really understandable. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So what are some of the different ways we use to visually represent um, data? Um, so we've seen tables, that's one way. Um, we've seen things like bar graphs, maps, another way of visually uh, representing information. And there's tons of other ways you can do this. And it really depends on what information you're trying to um, to convey as to what visualization you're going to choose. So it really depends on the story you're going to tell. Um, and often for um, people research, that's really like what our research questions are. So we need to really understand what, what it is that we're doing to be able to tell everybody else what it is we're doing. Um, so why do we do it? Um, we really do it for a few reasons. Um, in many ways, uh, we use visualization to save word count, and that's especially important when we're uh, writing things like grants um, and papers and that sort of thing. Um, but we also do it because we're trying to use a different medium to convey what we want. Um, a lot of people will learn best when they're actually just reading text and paper, but not everyone works that way, right? And so if we can kind of support the writing with good visualizations, uh, people are going to be really able to get more out of out of our work. So we're going to be able to increase the impact. Um, so I really like this quote, um, which one of my PhD supervisors, John Acott, passed on to me that he heard when he was a grad student. And the frustrating, it's really the frustrating part of building a good visualization is that once you see the thing you needed to see, you don't need the visualization anymore. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it so that we can summarize what we're doing in the best way. And again, making it precise and accurate. So we use data visualizations to tell a story. Um, we use them often to create accessibility of research. Um, again, uh, written language is one way of doing this, but oftentimes that's not necessarily um, the best way of doing things. So I was having a conversation with um, one of my lab mates. No, that's okay. We're just kidding. Oh. Good enough. I'll stop for a sec. You. you don't have a headset by any chance, do you? I don't. It's okay. Um, so as I was saying, yeah, so like um, we often want to increase the accessibility of our research. We're talking about, so we have um, a grad student who started who um, is among other things, uh, a visual artist, and she makes comics all the time. And she's been doing 
uh, comics to help uh, with knowledge translation. And we were jokingly saying like, if we gave policymakers a comic book, would we actually get our research to make more of an impact with them than if we gave them a written report? So there's a hypothesis there, one could test maybe, but um, but the idea is that there's a lot of different ways we can visually represent information. One of them being comics, lots of them being plots in a, in a paper. And then again, with written information, um, it's not always as accessible. Um, so I know if you were in Joey's talk this morning, he talked a lot about how to make writing accessible. Um, and I'm not trying to make everything Joey said obsolete. Um, it's meant to be sort of like in, in you know, we pair these things with our, our written communication. Um, but it's also a useful tool when we're doing um, like presentations and that sort of thing. Um, well, we like to summarize numbers and text. Um, nobody wants to see your, you know, 10,000 rows in your spreadsheet, right? That's why we put it in tables and figures. Um, and again, we want to reduce the word count while preserving information. And this is especially, um, especially an issue when um, we're doing things where we have a text box that has 25 characters and that's, or 2,500 characters and that sort of thing. Those things really matter. Um, and if you were uh, at Joey's talk earlier, he did talk about simplifying structure and conserving energy. And we're doing very similar things with data visualization, where we're just changing the format it's in to make it a little bit more um, easy for our participants and our stakeholders. To read. Um, we can focus readers attention. And again, if you were in Joey's talk, he talked about that as well. Um, Totally, we, we did our sides se separately despite what it looked like. Um, but you can, you can visualize what you think is important, right? When somebody's looking at um, a grant application or a paper, their eyes are gonna go to things that aren't the text, right? And so a really impactful visualization that's gonna focus the reader um, to really what the information um, that you want to convey to them. Um, and it can really over enhance the overall um, Discussion, sorry, it goes really fast, you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we can also use visualizations to skew data. We shouldn't, but this happens often. So this is a plot. Um, I'm, I'm gonna have a lot of COVID and epidemiology examples in here. Um, but this was a plot um, uh, looking at the top five counties with the greatest number of confirmed COVID cases. And if we just look at the plot as is, um, which people often do, they kind of just go to the bars and the colors and things like that. It looks like COVID cases might be going down. But when we actually look at the rest of the plot, we can see that they've actually, they've what they've done is they've reorganized the x-axis on this to make it look like cases are going down. So when you go across, the dates are actually not consecutive. And so this is not something we should do really. We should not be doing this, but this happens all the time because people put so much faith in having the data visualized, right? Like people do, you're sort of entering into a contract with them, right? Um, people assume that what you're what you're representing is accurate, um, and um, again, it's really balancing that with the visual aspects and like what's appealing to look at. Doesn't necessarily matter if we're misrepresenting things. It can be as pretty as you want, but if it's wrong, it's not useful. So a good visualization should, at the very least, increase the ability to discover insights about the data. So for example, if we have a table like this, we can see in, in one column, we see temperature values. Um, and then in the other column, we see iced tea, the amount of iced tea consumed in liters. So if we're looking at this table, we can say, okay, like, you know, lowest value looks to be maybe around 10 for temperature, that sort of thing. But when we actually visualize this, we can see that there's almost a perfect correlation between temperature increase and um, the amount of iced tea that's consumed. And this is something that, um, again, really shows us why it's important to choose a visualization that's um, that's meaningful and something really that's like, if I'm, if I'm reading a grant application and I see a table of numbers versus this, this is a lot more informative for me. Um, we also want to, again, generate confidence in the data. And again, you're entering into a contract with the people that you're reading, and they're gonna assume that you're being honest with what you're visualizing and things like that. Uh, we want to ensure that we're conveying the essence of the data, and we wanna minimize the time it takes for people to answer questions and ask questions about your data. And this is what's called the 
iced tea model. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we want to ensure that when we are making data visualizations, we can ensure that people get as much as possible out of them. So um, as, I, as I said, um, another goal maybe is to be, to use visualizations as a tool for data exploration. So in addition to using, getting the most out of our information, uh, we can learn a lot about our research and things like that from doing data visualization. Um, so we'll often use it before an analysis. Um, you can check your data are normally distributed. Again, this might just be like tabulating things, right? Like if you're working with text-based data, oftentimes, you know, if you're if you're looking at words and sentences and trying to extract sentiment out of them and that sort of thing, it might just be that creating a table is the best best thing for you to do with this particular data set. Um, and so again, it's really going to depend on your problem. Uh, the problem that you're working on. Um, you can also use it to identify out outliers um, and help with data cleaning as well as explore trends in the data. And this is especially important because in some cases we're not going to be able to use data visualization. We're not going to be able to present visualized data to people, but it will help us really understand our data in a way that can help us write about it in, in the best way possible. Um, so how do how do um, how does visual information convey meaning? So how do things like shapes and colors um, and positions convey meaning? So all graphical elements have a size, shape, and a color at the very least. Um, on plots, they also have a position. So it could be in one of four quadrants. It could be a sequential position. Um, lines also have a width and a type. And text has a font, uh, family, and face. So these are all things we can use as tools when we're visualizing data. Um, and this allows us to pack in a lot of information into essentially like a tiny little square in most cases, right? Um, there, again, is a balance between having something that's informative um, and something that's maybe got too much information in it, that sort of thing. Um, but these are all things we can play with. Um, and really the aesthetics are a combination of your personal preference as well as best practices. Again, as long as we're telling a complete accurate and precise story. Okay. Um, so aesthetics fall into two categories. Um, uh, those that can re represent continuous data. So values um, on some sort of spectrum um, and those that cannot. So continuous data aesthetics often come uh, fall to using position, size, color, line width. And those are things that we can kind of um, use to measure these continuous aspects. And discrete are things like shape and line type. So for example, um, a triangle doesn't necessarily have more value than a square, unless we're talking about sides, right? And so we keep those things in mind when we're doing our data visualizations. Um, so here is a plot that's talking about, it's essentially fuel efficiency on your y-axis and engine displacement on your x-axis. So this is a very busy plot. There's a lot going on. We can see that there's been color gradient um, and that's included uh, for measuring horsepower. We see size and that corresponds to weight. And then we see shape, which is the number of, of cylinders. Um, and so this here has a whole bunch of information packed into each, e each point on the plot. Um, and so again, this is something that would take you a little bit maybe to read, but if you were to write about all of this information, it's gonna take you a lot, lot, a lot more space, right? Um, and so these are the things that we want to consider when we're making um, our plots. One thing I do want to point out, though, is that darker shades are typically uh, perceived as having, um, sorry, like a higher quantity than lower shades. Um, and it's interesting, these things have been really tested quite a bit, um, and we do have preferences for those things. So when you're doing these things, like understanding really what people do is, um, and, and how people process information is a good part of it. Um, and so I hope, um, you know, as, as you go, you're able to sort of like critically assess people's visualizations, because some of them are very good. Others are not as good. Um, some of them are just there because it's like, you know, you, you can, 
have a figure, that sort of thing. But if the text says the exact same thing as your figure and your figure isn't really helpful, then there's sort of no point in doing that, right? We want to do things with our figures that we can't necessarily do in the space or with the text. Um, so some additional design considerations to make are that when you're making um, when you're making visualizations, um, one of the things you want to consider doing is adding image alternative text to them. Um, and this is a way of, um, it, it's for accessibility reasons. And so it's essentially, you're adding a description of your plot that if somebody who was visually impaired was reading your paper with sort of like a text to speech, for, for example, they would get a full description of your plot. So it's interesting because they were kind of like going back to text and then to speech with this, right? Um, but it is, you know, it's, it's an important component of this because not everybody um, is visually able to assess visualization the way um, people with non-impaired vision can. Um, and so this is something that is very hard to do um, to actually like describe your visualization, um, but there's um, best practices for how to do this. Another thing to do is using colorblind uh, friendly color palettes. So I typically work in R. There's tons of stuff for R, but there's there's equivalents elsewhere as well. Um, so for example, if we were to look um, at the um, leftmost side of the screen here, this is the colors we see when we have normal vision. Um, and we can see that each of these here um, are distinct colors for people that are visually impaired, that sort of thing. So these are all consider considerations to make um, when you're doing these data visualizations. Um, so how do we choose the right visualization? So on the top here is somebody who's made a pie chart with percentages. Um, we have 68% of people are worried, their biggest COVID worry is um, the economy, 62% are worried about their family getting it, and 48% are, um, or, are worried about getting it themselves. I don't know about you, but if I had more than 100% of pie, like that, that's a happy day, right? Pie chart, probably not the best way to visualize this data, right? And so I've just essentially said, okay, maybe like a bar plot, right? We can see that there's different proportions of these things. We don't know um, from this what exactly people were asked. I assume that um, if you can have more than 100%, then people are able to comment on each of these things. Like we're, made, we're getting assumptions from this data, right? But there's one way that's probably a little bit better than doing it. Because again, when we see a pie chart, we kind of think like we're, we're representing a whole and pieces of whole. But if we add up 68, 48, and uh, 62, we're going to get more than a whole sort of thing. So those are considerations to make. Um, I might skip through this and talk a little bit about, just for time, um, but my slides will be available for everybody. So I've gone through and talked about um, the types of data you might represent with each of these types of plots. Again, as a data scientist working in medicine, a lot of the graphical representation of data I do is with plots and graphs. Um, but I won't, we won't talk about that just for time, but it is there in the slides if you are interested. Um, I'll, but I will also talk in addition to plots, some of the things we can do. Um, so this is not a good example of a plot. Um, this is again, one of those ones where they're trying to cram a lot of information in and it's not really things that can be compared easily. Um, so the, a lot of these plot, a lot of these bad plots came out and a lot of these jokes about plot, bad plots came out during the pandemic. Um, another way of doing things visually is through an infographic. Um, an, another example of an infographic to an extent is a poster presentation. We're really truncating things and putting a, like a lot of visuals and that sort of thing into them. Um, one of the things that we're seeing more and more commonly um, is graphical abstracts becoming more common. So when you're, um, and if you were in Joey's talk, you'll know that graphical is, a zombie now. Uh, it is the term that's used typically by journals. I would say maybe graphic abstract, but graphical abstract is okay. Um, but what you're doing with these is you're using icons, images, diagrams, minimal text to sort of summarize your whole work. And the reason people are 
or, or I think journals are going this way is because it is, again, a lot more digestible to have these visualizations when we're able to, to represent our, our work visually. Um, and people want to, people like with information being so widely available on the internet, people digest so much. There's so much like, like if you had to read every single paper that you, you like, we, we all have that stack, that virtual stack on our desktop of papers that we're like, oh, I'll read that, right? But if we can have things like a graph, a graphic abstract to help us along, we might be able to be like, actually, that's not super informative for me. I'm going to save time by not reading that for that sort of thing, right? Um, and yeah, so it's becoming increasingly more common. Um, there is a website um, that can help get you started with these things called Tidbit. Um, but you can also use, you can also make these things with a PowerPoint slide, that sort of thing. We've done both in our lab. Um, Tidbit is nice because you can, a lot of times they'll be formatted for specific journals. So if you, if you know you're publishing with a particular journal, you can put the journal name in and um, it will gener generate a template for a graphical abstract or graphic abstract um, for that particular journal. Um, we also often see multi-dimensional or 3D plots. Um, so here we have flu up, up, uh, vaccine uptake by country. Um, 3D plots are not a good thing to do in a 2D medium. This is a bad plot. <laughs> um, uh, when you do have interactive data visualizations, which I have time, I'll show you one of them with the 3D plot. Um, it's, it's a very useful tool to be able to, uh, to visualize um, multiple variables at once and, and their relationships and interactions. But yeah, avoid it when you're when you're publishing in, in 2D. And then as I said, um, interactive dashboards. So web-based web -based interactive visualization. So I'm gonna try to click a link. I don't know if it's gonna take us out of um, so this is a project on vaccine serology that um, has recently more or less wrapped up in our lab, but um, this was one of the first is interactive data visualizations um, I worked on. Um, and we did build some 3D plots for them uh, to look at, oops, am I frozen? Might be frozen. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's not taking it. Oh, there we go. Um, so here is um, a plot you can actually manipulate. Um, and so you can view the data from different angles. Um, what we've done here is essentially, um, we have our participants age um, and how many days after uh, their vaccine, um, their, their blood was taken. Um, and then, on, on the uh, z-axis, technically, um, we have the level of um, antibody in their in their blood um, their blood sample, and so we can see with this plot here, if we turn it here, uh, we see that age. We see a slight decline overall in the levels, but more importantly, um, the as as you're getting farther and farther out of date from your vaccine dose, um, your number of antibodies drop significantly. And that's what essentially we're showing with this plot. What's cool about these um, visualizations that are interactive is you can actually like view just part of your data. Um, although I feel like I'm, this computer is, is making more and more fan noises at me. So, <laughs> um, so it is, much more processing intensive than a 2D plot. Um, but essentially, um, that's something else you can do. And what's great about this is when you have a grant application where you don't actually have a place for a figure, hyperlinks are text. So when you put text into your actual grant application, you can put it in there as see this website. And you can put tons of data, tons of visualizations and things like this. And that's sort of like, where sort of the next step we wanna go, right? And so how do we get the most out of our grant applications? So we can pack an entire study's worth of data into one of these websites. 
Um, this was coded in R. Um, I have experience as an R coder, um, but it is something that is very, like, it's very, there's step-by-step -step guides. So even if you're like, if you know R even slightly, you can probably take this on if you know people that can help you with it, which is coincidentally how I got my postdoc was they needed somebody who could code in R and I could, um, and I made a data visualization for them. Um, but essentially, What's great about these is you can put, you know, a 20 to 30 character hyperlink in your grant application and have a whole host of information here. It's not to say people will look at it 100% of the time, but if you have somebody that does, it can tell a much more complete story than a grant application. And we all know that even the longest grant applications, there's never enough words for what we want to say, right? And so um, I think that's that's where I'll end. Um, happy to answer any questions about it. Um, on my slides, I have a list of resources as well. Um, and um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. I don't know if I'm going to see them on the chat here or not. Let's see a chat window. I see a chat window. Yeah. yeah, that was really excellent. Oh, thank I you. Will, I gotta look at your slides. I'm actually gonna look at your slides and the resources you had. I think I have a more, more comment. Um, one, I think there are people interested in R. I haven't taken it, but I've heard from a few people. There's on Coursera. There's a free course from some John Hopkins, like some big university mm -hmm. in the state to recommend. I mean, apparently, has a good introduction to R. Yeah, I took that one actually when I, yeah, so after I finished my master's degree, I went into educational psychology and they're like, oh, you have a master's degree, you must know things about data and how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, okay. And I actually took that one and I felt that it was really good. Um, yeah, so yeah, very good recommendation. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's not a, you have to know if you can find people to collaborate with that do know it. Um, and that's that's a big thing. Well, oftentimes we're working in teams anyway, right? And, and so I think um, there's you know analogous things in in multiple coding languages too. Um, I just like the plug and play features of of the R aspect. So it's called um, Shiny Apps because they're nice and shiny, I guess. <laughs> And also, I just, I guess, nobody else asked any questions, just comments, maybe people love like those 3D charts, which you said, graphs, like not to people, why do people, like they just love, people just love them, I don't, I don't know well, it, It's very much like, a lot of times we think, and this is, goes to Joey's too, like we think more complex equals more smart, mm -hmm. right? And that's not the case, right? Like simpler and like more clear, precise, that's, that's where, you know, that's really where it should be, right? And I think like the amount of times we've had to like extract data from these 3D plots in 2D and you're like, I need a ruler a protractor for this, right? Like it's ridiculous, right? But when you see, like when you can see the 3D space um, and interact with it, it's a lot easier to do, right? Yeah. Although, I mean, when that was up, I had no idea. Like, I still really don't know what you're saying <laughs> because that's like, I'm not a data person. I'm right. not a graphy person yeah. and I like data visualizations but that to me right. like if, if your audience was me yeah you wouldn't have reached me so the problem but if you're closed yeah gave you a little spiel about what what to, what you're right. looking at what to what do. how to use it um but I just closed it because yeah <laughs> but I mean like but yeah you know well, that's fair yeah as research and pack Canada members yeah a lot of what we do is talking to people that aren't the people reading the grant right but the people that are being impacted by yeah. you having done that yeah. research so yeah it's like that for me would be like cool I think it was beautiful I liked <laughs> looking at it it made me feel good but I had no idea yeah. what you were saying as you were explaining yeah. that verbally I could begin to understand yeah but if I thought this was going out further I would want that title to tell me what I was seeing right because so we actually did, just, yeah so uh, we have a patient what we call a patient portal a participant yeah. portal with all of this information in um a, a participant friendly digestible yeah. um way um so what we've done for this is because we have sort of two purposes we have the grants and the physicians and scientists and then we also have these going out to um our afflicted individuals where we actually tailor the content a little bit different to them okay. um 
And so, yeah, it's a very valid point. Um, and we have, it is something we, we've done, we've thought of because we actually, we do um, a lot of integrated knowledge translation in our lab where we actually get um, participant feedback from very yeah. early stages. And one of the things was working with them to build an app that's useful for people that aren't scientists. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in there. So I, I was a participant in this and I get my individual level results back. And then I can go into this and I can find by selecting like Lindsay did, which age category I'm in, I can find which of those dots I'm in that group with. Right. And I can compare myself to the rest of this population and go, am I less risk? Increased yeah. risk, yeah. fairly average, what's going on? Um, so from the patient side of things, and especially being able to get in and manipulate it yourself instead of watching someone mm -hmm. manipulate it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. But I mean, I would think sitting yeah. back here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's but really I, fair. Yeah. I still feel like, you know, you could have an opportunity to change the title. But I think this is for a different, it's the, you're not the audience. You're I know, I know I'm not the audience. Yes, but, yes. Um, yeah. This that is something that you see, like, is a policy person going to look at that and go, or even a person that's about to go on the news and produce that disgusting pie graph that you showed? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I mean, I don't even know if that's yeah. just, this thing is accessible. But it's just like there's an opportunity, even if you're talking to, I mean, I've worked in healthcare. Yeah. I'm a, I was healthcare staff. Yeah. So technically, could have been this audience except that I still am not like, I'm not a super graphy person. Yeah. And again, if I was manipulating this myself, I could probably get there, but I think you could tell me, even in that title, tell me a little more. Yeah, so I, mean, that I would know really, yeah. how, to, how to play with it without yeah. reading, because you're trying to get people that aren't reading. So, yeah. Like, yeah, so the target, the target I, audience for this was, physicians who research um, COVID serology in IBD. So that's where, yeah, so the target audience was very, like this is, this was something where I was actually told to make it more, um, more, more scientific. And I was just like, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, as a non, you know, like my, my experience in medicine, my background is in linguistics, my experience in medicine is limited. And I was like, okay, I, you know, I'm not going to go any farther with this, with the jargon and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So really, yeah, like, I mean, that's a very fair point. Um, but yeah, like for this, the target audience for this was physicians, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for them, um, you know, I think they did want it to be much more um, scienced up. And we were like, well, you know, again, at what point is it going to be like, just because you have this specialization doesn't mean that physician at this university does as well, right? And yeah, so yeah. Um, it is something that we constantly try to navigate and have difficulties navigating, um, yeah. which is why one of our solutions really is to make separate actual web apps for, for our different stakeholders, just because um, it's in some ways uh, like a, a lot easier to sort of, again, focus their attention on what would be you know, the most useful for them.